Hello. Welcome to Switchable and Tunable Ferroelectric Devices for Adaptive and Reconfigurable RF Circuits with Amir Mortazawi. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by the MTTS Education Committee. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box in the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current page if you have any problems. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. You may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides that will be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Professor Mortazawi received a PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin in 1990. He is currently a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. His research interests include microwave and millimeter wave circuits, phase arrays, power amplifiers, ferroelectric thin film based devices, and frequency agile microwave circuits. He was the editor in chief for IEEE Transactions on Microwave Theory and Techniques from 2006 to 2010. He served on the IEEE MTTS Administrative Committee for eight years. Mortazawi also served as the associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Antennas and Propagation from 98 to 2001 and IEEE Transactions on, on Microwave Theory and Techniques in 2005. Professor Mortazawi is a fellow of IEEE. So now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Professor Mortazawi for switchable and tunable ferroelectric devices for adaptive and reconfigurable RF circuits. Amir? Uh, thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, as mentioned, the title of my talk is uh, <coughs> Switchable and Tunable Ferroelectric Devices for Adaptive and Reconfigurable RF Circuits. Um, <clears throat> I must say that bulk of um, presentation that I show is the result of work of many car uh, current and former students. I would like to acknowledge that. Um, <clears throat> so I go through some uh, introductory material first before I introduce our work in the area of tunable and switchable circuits, RF circuits. Um, current um, RF uh, front ends in radios are becoming more and more complex. Um, the job of uh, RF front end is to provide reliable communication, uh, should be able to support multiple um, wireless communication standards, um, utilize uh, wireless spectrum efficiently. And on the left side, if you look at the RF front end in, of 1990s, only consisted of an LNA, PA, maybe a couple of filters. However, on the uh, right side, um, the current RF front end, which must accommodate many standards and frequency bands, uh, include uh, many LNAs, um, number of PAs, all connected through uh, diplexers, number of filters to switchplexers, and to connect uh, to operate at each band, one need to uh, select a particular filter and um, LNA and PA, and that makes the RF front end to be very complex. So uh, one, w one could propose that uh, new techniques are uh, needed to reduce complexity of multi-frequency, multi-standard transceivers, and um, perhaps tunable and switchable RF circuits can play a critical role in uh, reducing the cost and complexity of today's uh, RF circuits, RF systems. Um, you noted that as uh, part of, you know, uh, RF front-end filters play an important role, 
Um, there are multitude of filters incorporated into today's mobile radios. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the progress of filters from 60s or 70s, where used cavity filters to eventually ceramic filters, um, which uh, reduce the size and cost. And uh, however, today the um, commonly used filters in RF radios in RF front ends are uh, acoustic base filters because acoustic or piezoelectric based filters can meet the stringent requirements that placed on uh, RF communication systems. And these filters are based on either thin film, uh, film bulk acoustic resonators, FBARs, or SMRs, solidly mounted resonators that use BRAC reflectors to reflect acoustic energy back into the resonator. And so uh, current filters are based on uh, aluminum nitride uh, resonators, uh, piezoelectric resonators. And on the left side, you can see the evo evolution of aluminum nitride based uh, resonators in 90s or so. The cues that could be achieved using these resonators was about a couple of hundred, but today's resonators can achieve cues of five thousands or higher. I should mention that um, current filters, aluminum nitride based filters, are not tunable or switchable. So uh, in order to select, therefore, a particular uh, band and filter, we need to use um, switch plexers in front of filters. The heart of what I'll be presenting um, is um, based on um, field tunable polarization of ferroelectric um, or barium stanserum titanate BST material. Um, BST is man-made material um, in 50s or so uh, introduced for jewelry applications due to its high index of refraction. Um, so as, as mentioned here, um, Ferroelectric material polarization or dielectric constant is a function of electric field. If you operate the material below Curie temperature or in ferroelectric mode on the uh, bottom left side, you can see the material um, <coughs> exhibits a hysteretic response, polarization versus electric field. But however, above Curie temperature, material uh, polarization is not hysteretic. And that's where we use the material to make uh, tunable um, microwave circuits because material can be used as a varactor or can be used to make varactors. By the way, the uh, Curie temperature for the material can be adjusted by changing the stoichiometry of uh, barium strontium within um, BST. Uh, typically, we use uh, 50-50 material with Curie temperatures of about minus 50 degrees C. Just to um, explain the material behavior better, uh, <clears throat> the polarization or dielectric permittivity in the material is a function of applied bias or electric field the figure shows here uh, the dielectric constant as a function of DC bus. As you can note, the permittivity versus applied bus is symmetric with DC bus uh, or electric field direction. So whether we apply negative or positive bus to one electrode, um, electric field tunability varies uh, symmetri symmetrically. Furthermore, the loss tangent for the material is shown in purple curve. As you know that um, the Q of material, which is one over loss tangent, is several hundred. So one can fabricate materials or deposit materials with high Qs and that, that provide dielectric tunabilities that are typically more than three to one. Um, <clears throat> There is also another important property uh, that ferroelectric uh, 
exhibit, and that's electric field induced piezoelectricity. Um, on the left side, behavior of a typical piezoelectric material like aluminum nitride is shown. Um, material <clears throat> has a built-in strain in material of the bias or electric field applied to it. So aluminum nitride, for example, is piezoelectric in material of the uh, bias or electric field. However, ferroelectric material like BST are not piezoelectric when there is no bias applied. Um, however, if you apply a bias to a material, you can induce strain, and strain is a function of electric field, and so uh, you can turn on and off the piezoelectricity by applying bias to the material, and that's a key um, a functionality, um, key behavior that allows one to make switchable or inherently switchable or uh, tunable filters. So I first go over the application, one application, one particular application of a material, BSD material, in designing tunable reactors uh, for matching circuits. And then most of my talk, then I stress on application of material on uh, switchable resonators and filters. Uh, the structure of a basic BST reactor is shown on the left side. Essentially, a thin layer of BST is sandwiched between two bottom and top electrodes. The uh, capacitance for the material as a function of DC bus is shown. Typically, one can get um, tunabilities of 3 to 1 or larger, depends on the material thickness. I must say that tunable reactors are very fast. Uh, for example, on the right, you can see some results published in 2006 in Applied Physics, which shows that the material can maintain its tunability at frequencies even as high as uh, terahertz or so. So uh, tunable reactors have a number of advantages as compared to uh, semiconductor reactors as well as MEMS-based reactors. First, they can achieve tunabilities uh, that are 3 to 1 or so. Um, they are quite fast. Um, they do not need to be reverse passed. That is the case for uh, junction reactors. For that reason, uh, the material does not uh, uh, is not uh, that sensitive to application of um, RF amplitude across it. In case of reactors, as the RF amplitude across the material, uh, the diode increases, you need to further and further reverse bias it, and that phenomenon is called hot tuning in reactors. For ferroelectrics, because the uh, tunability is symmetric with respect to bus. Um, the hot tuning is not as severe as reactors. Um, material can be deposited on low-loss substrates and incorporated with other low-loss RF components like antennas and transmission lines. So you do not need to wire bond the material or, or, or such reactors or flip chip them and so on. That's, that's the case for diode reactors. Um, the cues that one can achieve at microwave frequencies larger than 100. Um, <clears throat> the material does not need any hermetic packaging. They can, as mentioned, handle higher RF powers um, and is very fast. Uh, typically, uh, such materials are deposited either using pulse laser deposition or RF spidering. Um, Pulse laser deposition allows uh, faster material growth, uh, but um, not as a good uniformity, not with uh, such good uniformity as compared to um, sputtering, RF sputtering. So at U of M, we currently use the RF sputtering technique to grow the material. Uh, typically, we can grow the material on four inch silicon substrates with good stoichiometry. 
the uh, Vactor, BSD Vactor fabrication process steps shown here, uh, material is deposited on uh, silicon or sapphire. First, we uh, deposit bottom electrodes, uh, pi platinum, and then BSD is deposited, then top electrode, uh, type platinum deposited, BSD is etched. For biasing, applying the electric field to capacitors, we need uh, high resistivity silicon chrome line. Uh, shown in on the right side in green. Then for rest of interconnects, we use again um, platinum, uh, type platinum uh, interconnect, and to reduce, of course, the RF loss, we deposit a thick layer of gold on top of the uh, capacitors. Uh, and the bottom shows two capacitors in series. So access to capacitors are obtained from top side and are measured using um, wafer probe stations. Uh, the permittivity of material is a function of its thickness. So typical material that we grow is about 60, 70 nanometer thick, which provides three to one tunability. Uh, one can achieve higher tunabilities and higher permittivities by increasing material thickness. However, as you increase the material thickness, um, Q of material drops. So there's a sweet spot in terms of the material thickness used for reactor applications. Uh, like reactors, the material is nonlinear. So uh, <clears throat> as, as, as I showed, the tunability is a bell-shaped function of applied electric field. To make the material linear, uh, one can stack number of capacitors. That means one can place many capacitors in series. For example, if you are trying to design a capacitor with capacitor C0, one can place five capacitors, having each having capacitance five C0 in series. So total capacitance is C0. The RF is applied across the stack of capacitors, so therefore RF is divided across these capacitors. However, capacitors can be biased individually, as sh shown on the right side using just high resistivity uh, interconnects, silicon chrome lines. And so one can therefore tune the material at low uh, DC bias voltages, but because RF is applied across the stack of material, um, a stack of capacitors, each capacitor experiences small RF swing. So on the uh, bottom left side, for example, you see the tunability as a function of applied bias voltage, it's normalized to one. Um, so for example, one picofarad capacitor. As uh, you increase the bias voltage, of course, the capacitance decreases. Uh, this, this is measured uh, when uh, different RF voltage amplitudes are applied across the stack of capacitors from 0.8 volt peak to peak to 20 volt peak to peak, as you know, the tunability does not change. Tunability does not change as we increase the bias, uh, uh, the amplitude of RF voltage. Uh, furthermore, uh, one can measure the uh, IP3 or IP3 for such devices, and by stacking larger and larger number of uh, devices, one can imp increase the IP3 significantly to uh, numbers close to 50 dBm or so. And so uh, one application of um, Varactors is to design um, matching circuits for power amplifiers. Um, perhaps uh, you are familiar with uh, behavior of power amplifiers uh, and their efficiency as a function of uh, efficiency drop as a function of reduced drive level. Uh, typically, amplifiers or DPAs are designed to achieve highest efficiency as a particular uh, output power. Uh, however, if you reduce the output power level without changing the load provided to amplifiers efficiency significantly degrades, as shown on the uh, uh, graph on the left side. So showing drain efficiency versus back off. If one be able to change the 
applied uh, or, or present a load to the power amplifier, one could maintain the efficiency at higher levels, uh, even though uh, the uh, output power is reduced. So, so by designing a, a um, variable uh, load provided by tunable matching circuit, one could maintain the efficiency of PAs. Um, on the left side in Smith chart, you can see the trajectory of a uh, load of provided to power amplifier in order to maintain its efficiency. On the uh, upper right side, uh, again, uh, shows the behavior of uh, an amplifier, uh, its efficiency as a function of output power level. You can design an amplifier to achieve its highest efficiency at a particular power level, but if the power level is varied by reducing the drive, then efficiency degrades. If, however, uh, a matching circuit is provided which allows the uh, load presented to amplifier uh, to vary, uh, then one could uh, maintain the peak efficiency uh, although the power level is varied. And this is important so that you can um, improve the battery life in mobile phones, um, maintain efficiency, and even, if needed, improve the linearity. For example, a tunable matching network is designed uh, where you change the matching, in fact, instantaneously as you modulate the power amplifier, you apply modulated signal to power amplifier. And depends on the load provided to power amplifier, one could either achieve um, improved efficiency or improved linearity. Uh, such a tunable matching circuit was designed uh, using BST variactors, as shown. Uh, the matching circuit consists of three sections, two uh, two stage, uh, well, two uh, phase shifters using old pass networks and one variable transformer. Um, and that allows one to move the uh, tune the load uh, on a good part of Smith chart. The um, <clears throat> tunable matching circuit was fabricated, as mentioned, on silicon. Uh, the photograph on the right side shows the structure of the one of the old pass networks, and there are three of them connected to each other. There is also a capacitor that isolates the transformer from the phase shifter. And uh, the measure result for a particular uh, amplifier is shown, uh, power, power added efficiency versus output power. Uh, different point indicates the efficiency obtained at a, uh, for a particular load value presented to uh, power amplifier. So as output power varies, one could adjust the load to follow the peak efficiency um, by connecting um, this uh, dot, the, 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 the points measured. However, if you're willing to sacrifice of efficiency and improve the linearity, that also can be done. And that's shown by a green line, uh, shows the trace of efficiency as a function of um, power. And on the right side, for example, ACPR comparison uh, for a amplifier that with a fixed load and ACPR for amplifier which uses an adaptive matching circuit is shown. Um, one could improve um, efficient uh, ACPR by at least 10 dB or so. So that shows one application of um, vector based or BSD based uh, tunable matching circuits. Um, for most of the rest of my talk, I will concentrate on application of um, film bulk, uh, well, BSD in designing film bulk acoustic wave resonators that can be switched on and off by application of um, DC bias. So a film bulk acoustic resonator consists of an acoustic uh, piezoelectric material sandwiched between 
two electrons, very similar to a capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor, except that um, the HFA, the bulk of, bulk of silicon underneath of the um, material, so therefore the membrane can resonate at uh, microwave frequencies. So on the left side, you can see the uh, structure of an F-bar that uh, uses a BSD thin film as the, um, <clears throat> as the piezoelectric material. On the right side also uh, shows a, an F-bar. However, this is, uh, shows a composite F-bar where BSD is used as actuation layer. However, silicon is uh, used, uh, you, uh, is uh, most of the acoustic energy is stored in silicon, or silicon uh, is used uh, as significant part of the parallel plate resonator. Uh, because BSD-based FRs can be turned on and off, they are modeled at two different states, off states and on state. In off state, material essentially acts like a fixed capacitor, um, say capacitance CE, which is losses due to the dielectric material and also conductors. However, if the material is biased, the structure is biased, then it acts like a, um, <coughs> a piezoelectric resonators that model by modified um, MBVD, B, um, butterworth van Dyke uh, model. The resonator has two different branches. One is in uh, electrical branch consisting of um, RS, CE, uh, RE, and then acoustic branch consisting of LM, CM, and RM. And by measuring these series and power resonance, power, power resonance frequencies, one can determine the electromechanical coupling coefficient in the material. That determines how efficiently electric uh, signal, RF signal, is converted to acoustic energy signal. And uh, <clears throat> having the uh, coefficient of uh, electromechanical coupling, and, uh, and one could then determine the, uh, and also capacitance, one could determine LM, CM, and other uh, parameters in the um, MBVD model. One can also uh, use the one-dimensional uh, transmission line-based modeling to model acoustic resonators. In this case, uh, BSD is shown in red, and then um, conductors, aluminum, uh, platinum and gold on the top, and platinum and silicon dioxide on the bottom, and maybe bulk of silicon underneath if it's not etched. It, these all form a... Uh, transmission line structure and by uh, solving essentially a <coughs> uh, such a structure one can determine the resonance frequency of it but using trans transfer resonance technique. Uh, first, uh, we, we published the, the result for the first inherently or intrinsically switchable BSD acoustic resonators in 2007. The photograph of the structure is shown on the left side. It's very small, 80 by 80 micrometer. Um, <clears throat> the off-state response on the Smith chart is shown in the middle of the graph. If you do not apply any bias, uh, the structure acts like a, essentially capacitor shown in a, a dot, a black dot point. However, if you turn on the resonator by applying bus, then you can switch on the resonance, and it, like any um, F-bar, it exhibits a series resonance and a power resonance shown on Smith chart. As you increase the bus voltage, the strength of resonance increases because the coefficient of electromechanical coupling increases with bias. Uh, on the left uh, bottom uh, view graph also, uh, one can see the 
magnitude of impedance for such a resonator as a function of frequency. When no bias is applied, that's shown with, um, by blue line, and then when the bias is applied with the red line. So the material, the, the resonator can be uh, turned on and off merely by applying electric field. There is no current draw, so therefore to turn the resonator on and off, you don't consume any power. The more recent result is shown for a 2 gigahertz switchable BSD F bar. Um, <clears throat> the structure of F bar is shown, and the um, measured and modeled um, response for the resonator on Smith chart shown bottom left side. If the uh, resonator is off, no bias is applied. You see just capacitance. And, and if you turn on the resonator uh, with a blue or red curve, sh show the series resonance and pair resonance, the coefficient of KT square is 9%. It's higher than typical aluminum nitride F bar, which have KT squares about 7 to 8%. Um, mechanical quality factor for this resonator was about 380. Uh, this resonator is very small, about 68 by 68 micrometer, and also the uh, KT square uh, as a function of DC bus is measured. Uh, you can even uh, achieve higher KT squares if you increase the bus to about 25 volts or so. One can make composite resonators, that is, BSD material used only as actuation uh, active layer, and most of the acoustic energy is within silicon underneath of BSD. The structure of a composite F-bar is shown on the left side. Typically, one can use over-molded resonators, um, <clears throat> so, uh, which, which can operate at higher frequencies. For example, one can um, excite uh, mode, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth mode. It depends on the uh, mode uh, of resonance determined by BSD to silicon thickness ratio. The coefficient of electromechanical coupling can be optimized, and also uh, it can also uh, uh, it's it's trade off trade off between K2 squared and mechanical uh, quality factor can be determined through just basic uh, analysis done by um, one dimensional model. So one can see how uh, these two um, are trade off. How one could improve Q at a, by reducing KT squared or vice versa. A result for a measured um, <clears throat> composite resonator is shown here. Again, is about 40 micrometer by 40 micrometer. When it's off and off state, no bias is applied. The device acts like a capacitor. When it is turned on, uh, it again acts like an acoustic resonator. In this case, also, you can see a smaller circle that indicates that there is a parasitic resonance, unfortunately, in this case. But um, because silicon, bulk of silic, bulk silicon has lower acoustic losses, by designing composite f bar, one could increase the Q at the cost, of course, reducing the KT squared. For this particular resonator, the KT squared was measured to be 0.86% at 2.4 gigahertz, at, sorry, at 2.5 gigahertz, but mechanical quality, mechanical quality factor is about 970. So it's significantly improved. Of course, our aim is to improve the material um, deposition in order to increase the Q. Um, in order to uh, design F-bars 
at various frequencies, different frequencies, one need to change the thickness of the material deposited. Um, one could design contour mode resonators where the lateral dimensions of resonator determine the resonance frequency. In that case, the fabrication becomes simpler and one can make a number of resonators having different resonance frequencies using just one fabrication step, merely by changing the lateral dimensions of the structure. And so the contour mode resonator is shown on the right side. We have also designed um, contour mode resonators using interdigitated structures, where the periodicity of the contour mode resonators determines the resonance frequency as shown here. And typical structures operate uh, at, at gigahertz frequencies. By changing the periodicity, or el that is electrode width, one can change the resonance of such devices. Again, they can be turned on and off if no bias is applied, no resonance is observed by, by application of bias, one can turn on the resonance. We have also measured uh, the uh, turn uh, on and off or so-called reliability of BSTF bars under uh, many switching cycles by applying, by pulsing the resonators. Uh, as you note, by pulsing resonators up to even 10 to the 9 cycles or so, the Q and KT square uh, remain constant, do not change, indicating that you can turn on and off such resonators many, many times without degrading the material properties. Also, temperature-dependent characteristic of BST is shown here. Like aluminum nitride, uh, material sh shows somewhat temperature dependency, but the uh, TCF for the material, uh, in this case for resonator, composite resonator measures, is about minus 35 ppm per, uh, per degree C, which is quite similar to aluminum nitride F bar composite resonators. Um, so as Temperature varies, of course, re resonance shifts slightly. Um, in order to correct for that, uh, one can use material with uh, positive uh, TCF to compensate for it, like silicon dioxide. Um, because also material is tunable, by changing the bus voltage, one can also slightly change the resonance frequency, therefore, by a tuning bus, one could also um, help reducing the temperature sensitivity of the uh, resonator uh, frequency of operation. Um, we have also studied large signal uh, behavior of BSDF bars. I won't, I won't get into this. This is published already, but there are a number of nonlinear elements within the uh, intrinsically switchable uh, BSDF bars that should be modeled accurately in order to uh, <coughs> predict the behavior of resonators, both as a function of DC bus voltage and also RF signal applied to the resonators. When using these resonators to make filters, of course, it's very important to understand the nonlinear characteristics of F-bar uh, in order to make filters that provide the uh, necessary linearity for RF applications. So typical way of designing um, Bar filters is, is to you to make a ladder structure using number of BST uh, number of acoustic resonators. Um, in, on the left side, you can see the ladder type structures using piezoelectric resonators by um, <coughs> staggering the series by tuning by adjusting the series resonance of um, 
series resonators to chant resonance of pair resonances, pair resonance resonators, one can design, make a, well, one could achieve a bandpass filter response as shown on the right side. So um, we, um, <clears throat> using image parameter, met image parameter method, we, um, that, uh, we we developed a technique that allows uh, simple uh, filter design using um, acoustic resonators. And at this point, I would like to just show the um, measure response of some of the filters that we have fabricated. In this view graph, you can see a uh, switchable um, one and a half stage um, acoustic filter using BST resonators. If the filter is off, there is no filtering property. No, if filter is not passed, no filtering property. On the bottom uh, graph, you see, you see S21 as a function of frequency. The red line shows the attenuation. Uh, with no bus applied, get 15 dB of attenuation or so for such a low order filter. When the filter is turned on or biased, then um, the, it, it behaves like a bandpass filter as shown in the blue curve. And the insertion loss in this, for this filter is about 2.25 dB. Of course, it's much higher than it's needed for RF applications. Of course, this is, a, um, this is something that need, requires more work in order to improve the Q. Um, <clears throat> bandwidth is about 56 megahertz, uh, or 22.7%. The structured photograph of the filter is shown on the right side. We have also fabricated higher order filters, for example, the two and a half stage um, BSD uh, F bar. The major results shown on the right side. Uh, of course, filter performance in terms of its um, rejection is better as compared to one and a half stage filter. S21 or uh, insertion loss as a function of frequency is shown. When no bias is applied to filter, um, we get about 30 dB or so of attenuation. And if it's turned on, again, you get uh, about 4.3 dB insertion loss in the, in the pass band. By the way, these filters are biased by applying the um, DC voltage at the input and output through the um, signal ground signal probe. A result for a uh, two, three and a half stage filter is shown here. It provides, of course, a better rejection of about 40 dB or so. Again, on and off response are shown. In order to improve the response, one could design acoustically, acoustically coupled filters uh, where interdigit inter structures are coupled together uh, instead of uh, capacitively uh, using acoustic response. In this case, the, using lower order filters, one could achieve better uh, isolation between the output and input. Uh, an example is shown here, a second order acoustic coupled filter operating at uh, 0.75 gigahertz. Um, when filter is off, or no bias is applied, about 40 dB uh, of isolation is achieved, the rejection is achieved. When the filter is on, uh, the response is shown in the red. In this case, uh, this was the first fabrication of such and of course we had a spurious resonance which dq the filter, so its session lost about 8 dB or so, 7 dB. Also the 
return loss as a function of frequency is shown for both off and on response. Um, one could study the trade-off between um, coefficient of electromechanical coupling and Q uh, value needed to achieve filters with uh, low insertion loss. Based on our study, we need to improve the Qs to about 1,000 or so, 600 or above, um, for to, to provide um, filters with insertion losses that are about a couple of dB and achieve um, isolations, out-of-band isolation about 50 dB or so. I should, I should mention that um, designing this intrinsically switchable filter is somewhat more complex as compared to typical filter because a typical filter is always shows filtering properties. There is no on and off state. For, piezoelectric, for switchable BSD filters, um, they behave differently. When the filter is off, you expect rejection. When filter is on, of course, you expect this bandpass response. And so off state response must also be considered when designing these filters. Ultimately, one would like to uh, connect a number of such filters in parallel to make uh, switchable filter banks without using um, RF switches along the input and output of filters. Merely by applying bus to individual filters, one can turn on a particular band. Um, simulation result for, for example, a filter consisting of four, um, a filter band consisting of consists of four channels shown here on the right side. By turning on, each, turning on each filters, one can turn on each particular band. And we have demonstrated the proof of concept by connecting three um, one and a half stage F-bar filters in parallel. The photograph for the filter is shown on the left side. By applying bias uh, to the bus lines indicated on the photograph, one can turn on individual filters. The measure result for the um, switchable filter bank is shown on the right side. And this insertion loss as a function of frequency is shown. The green, red, and blue lines shows uh, when each individual filter is turned on. So by placing larger and larger number of filters in shunt, one, one could imagine making um, filters that could could be could turn on to could be turned on at different bands without requiring complex switches, switch plexers. Finally, the vision for a frequency agile and power efficient RF front end based on Multifunctional materials, two level materials is shown where um, all the switches in the front end selecting filters are removed, eliminated. Individual filters can be turned on by applying just DC bus control to each filter. Uh, furthermore, uh, one may not need to use uh, many LNAs and power amplifiers uh, by making tunable LNAs and tunable power amplifiers, one could adjust the frequency of operation. In that way, one can hopefully significantly in reduce the cost and uh, complexity of our front ends. Uh, so this concludes my talk. Um, I went over the application of BST uh, for making um, tunable uh, capacitors, reactors, um, that can be used in designing tunable antennas, tunable filters, tunable matching circuits, as well as uh, electrostriction uh, or switchable piezoelectric response of BSD that can be used in making switchable resonators and switchable 
filters. And um, thanks for your attention. If there are now any questions, I would uh, try to answer them. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Amir. That was very interesting and looks uh, looks really quite promising. Uh, so like you said, now it's time for the question and answer session. Uh, we have a handful of questions here. Uh, I'll try to get through as many as I can. Uh, but before we start, please also remember that you can still submit your questions through that Q&A panel. All right, I'm going to combine some of these questions together as well. So uh, what kind of applications are you targeting for the FBARs? And also, what is the commercial market and availability uh, currently for, uh, for BST-based devices? Well, for switchable FBARs, of course, um, one could imagine applications in both RF front end where uh, filters are removed and replaced by filter banks using um, switchable F bars. Um, one could also make, for example, switchable resonators that can allow uh, oscillators to frequency hop by turning on number of resonators. So that these are some applications. In terms of Commercialization. I'm, I'm, um, there are very only very few groups working on universities and developing uh, this switchable inherently switching a switchable F bars. Uh, still, there is um, some some work need to be done for such filters to be commercialized. One is, of course, um, understanding the nonlinearities and uh, designing filters that could achieve. Uh, high level of linearity, and that that's, can be done by placing number of resonators in series. Improving the Q of resonators is another important task that need to be, need to be done. Okay, great. Uh, so here's a question on switching speed. So how fast is the BST, or the BST-based devices, what is, what is their switching speed? How does it relate to size? Yes, yeah, so inherently material can be switched on and off in picosecond. It's very fast. As I mentioned, the tunability of material is maintained even up to terahertz. Um, of course, the uh, speed of tuning is a function of the biasing circuit. So if there are RC time constants, uh, that would slow down the uh, the this, the speed of tuning, but that's not inherent to the material structure. It can be tuned very fast. So if bar circuit is designed correctly, it should be um, much, much faster than, say, MEMS-based. It's comparable to varactors, diet varactors. Okay. Um. For these types of devices, what is the maximum usable voltage level? Well, um, for, example, for, for for example, for tuning. Sorry. Yes, yeah, for tuning, uh, the the thickness of material can be uh, can dictate the um, tuning bias. Um, if material is thin, about sixty seventy nanometer. Um, Tuning uh, can be as small as um, 5 to 10 volts, but for thicker material, you can have uh, voltages uh, as high as 100 volts. Um, so one can use materials or varactors in series and shunt in order to adjust both the capacitor, capacitance and also uh, the tuning voltage. If high, for example, for high power applications, one, as I mentioned, you can stack these and apply uh, high RF swings across them without breaking the material, breaking down the material. So for each individual structure, approximately what voltage would that be? So typically, in applications that we intend, uh, the smaller tuning voltage, the better. So in that case, you can tune these things at voltages about five volts or so. Okay, great. All right, so here's another question. Uh, 
what do you mean when you say the VST has higher tunability than MIMS? How are you defining tunability? Well, uh, let me go back, refer to... By the way, when, when I talked about MIMS, I refer to uh, air um, MIMS-based reactors that um, air is used as the uh, separate the two membranes, MEMS. Um, let me go back, but well, if I be able to find yes here. So um, for for example, um, my understanding is that. Uh, typical MEMS provide two to two to one, three to one tunability or so. For this material, for BSDs, if you increase the thickness, you can get tunabilities of larger than six to one to um, ten to one. In this case, you, you know, for example, permittivity variation for a 600 nanometer thick um, BSD is very the permittivity varies from say 650 or so to about 150. Um, the tunability is defined, for example, at when voltage is zero, that provides the largest value of capacitance, and also at the voltage level where capacitance does not vary uh, very much, that's the lowest value. So that ratio can be used as a measure of tunability. Okay, great. I think that shed, sheds some light on that. Uh, so for the filters, uh, how can the insertion loss be improved uh, for, the, for the bandpass filters, for example? Yes. So, of course, uh, the, what we are working, we have been working on uh, quite a, you know, for the past several years, one can trade off between Q and KQ squared. In general, insertion loss is a function of two times kt squared in the material. Fortunately, kt squared in BST is quite high. Um, you can, I believe, even achieve kt squares of above 10. And so, although um, Qs that we have achieved, you know, have not gone for for a for a non-composite material structure is about 300 or so. For composite, we can get Qs as high as 1,000. But um, because KT squares can be high, even uh, I mentioned, you know, 10 or even 20 percent, one can trade that off with Q uh, to, to to provide to design filters with reasonable insertion loss. Okay, great. All right. Let's see. Let's try to squeeze in one more question here. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of an in interpretation here. So do you know the TCF in the BST film? I'm assuming that's separated from the composite structure, so, so perhaps just the film by itself. So, you know, uh, we have measured, we have, you know, preliminary measurement for just um, non-composite uh, resonators, uh, and that's about typical minus 60 uh, part per million per centigrade. And please note yeah, that also the resonance frequency can be adjusted here um, with application of, by, by changing the bias voltage slightly. Okay, yeah, I think that's, I think that's totally fine. Um, okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, there are still a few questions here, and I believe the presenter will follow up with those unanswered questions offline. Uh, as we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org. All the registrants will get an email reminder with a website address when that's available. For attendees who would like to receive PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code that's provided on the last side of, slide of this presentation, which is that that's shown here. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Professor Morizawi for this excellent and informative presentation. Special thanks to our audience for joining us today. 
We hope you found today's event valuable and that you return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much.